Yeah, no, this cancer story is going to be a huge story going forward. I believe my, my faculty advisor in the, my, my fellowship, in my current oncology fellowship I'm doing at the University of South Florida, has just been recruited by Cancer Centers of America to do his glycolytic um, metabolic pathway. Uh, in, and I'd like to bring that to Milwaukee. I'd like to bring that technology to Milwaukee. Vitamin K. How many here people here are taking vitamin K? Just quickly, what about the risks of ketogenesis? Pardon? What about the risks with being ketogenic? Uh, there have been children since 1950 on ketogenic diets uh, for, to prevent seizures. I've taken one person who was fired from her job because of seizures and turned her seizures off. Uh, there's about 10,000 children who've been on ketogenic diets for 50 years so far, and we haven't seen much trouble. Okay, vitamin K. By the way, it's nice to see you, too. <laughs> Pleasure to see filmy, friendly faces that I know. Thank you for all coming here. I feel very honored to have you here. Uh, vitamin K is a whole new story, and it really should be titled <coughs> Vitamin K2. So I'm going to tell you the story tonight. So I want you to go home. Everybody here's job is to go home and tell their friends and tell everybody you know, because 100% of you should be on vitamin K. So here's my 30-second bio. I grew up in India until I was 18 years old. I went to a British boarding school and learned a lot of obsessive compulsive habits. <laughs> Uh, I did pretty traditional medicine for 25 years, so I know internal medicine, emergency medicine, cold. I was the medical director at St. Luke's in Sinai. And then I started getting the, and I came over to the light side and began to realize that medicine today, as it's currently practicing, is a problem. And so I got board certified in a couple different forms of anti med and I've done a fellowship and all that stuff. And that makes it, I'm having the time of my life. This is the future of medicine. For those of you who don't see my passion, Oh, shucks. <laughs> so, objective. I want to tell you how vitamin K was discovered, what it does, what I'm calling the calcium conundrum, or what went wrong, or the collaboration between A and D and healing bones, reversing heart disease. I've got about three hours of lecture tonight, so I'm going to see how much I can get through, and don't mind interrupting, because we learn the most when you ask questions. Okay? So, I'm going to try to do it an hour and a half, because uh, Dan gets tired somewhere. He's been here standing for 12 hours. So, history. How it got lost. <coughs> This is how we found vitamin K. In the mid-30s, there's a Danish biochemist, and this was back in the era where we're discovering vitamins. And you feed very odd diets to different animals and see what they die from, and then try to figure out why they don't die. So a Danish biochemist is feeding chickens pure cholesterol, and they bleed to death. So if they bleed to death, there must be some coagulation factor. In German, is coagulation is about the K. So he said there must be some bis missing vitamin K. Well, it turned out an American guy by the name of Doisy, so it's Dam and Doisy, sounds like I'm talking with a New Jersey accent. <laughs> uh, get, Doisy figures it out because he gives ch chickens a spinach and then he finds out what's in spinach and finds out and finds out and finds out and finally gets down to vitamin K. And they get the Nobel Prize for it in 1943. And they called it the coagulation nutrient and they said humans make gobs of it in your gut. So what does traditional vitamin K that your gut, how do we block it and get rid of it? What's the drug we do to block traditional vitamin K? Coumadin. So we said everybody makes lots of vitamin K in their gut. You got loads of vitamin K in your gut. No big deal. Don't worry about it. You got plenty of vitamin K. And that's where we left it. So we made three mistakes. Because at that time we, we found K1 and K2. And we said they're both the same variant of the same bug. And it's all about coagulation. And we decided deficiency was very rare because you got plenty in your gut. All three of those turn out to be mistakes. And so here's K2. You can see here's K1. So this is about coagulation. You can see there's no double bonds here. And actually, you can see these little double lines. This is what humans make. And we're going to get to this is what natto makes, or this is what Bacillus subtilis does, the bacteria. So this is sort of a slightly artificial, nevertheless made by a, a bacteria. This is what humans naturally make, or cows naturally make. OK. So that's the, here's what we call K2, is otherwise known as menaquinone 4 or menaquinone 7 and K1. So, so there's two forms. So there were then the Nobel Prize 1943 and the 1975 at Harvard, they discovered this stuff called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin turns out to be the critical protein, prote protein that chelates calcium atoms. It chelates calcium atoms because it's got these two little, and then it can take those calcium atoms and plug them into your bone. So osteocalcin is the most abundant protein in your bone. Uh, after, after uh, I'm sorry, block, I'm blocking what the most abundant one is, but so osteocalcin, though, is responsible. So I was discovered at Harvard in 1975. 
And since then, we've been discovering all sorts of interesting things about osteocalcin. For example, when you exercise, your body puts it out and it goes all around your body and helps lower your blood sugar for like two days. So it's quite effective. It's a wonderful drug when doing that. So that was found at Harvard 1975. In the 1990s, we find something called matrix GLA protein, uh, which is a very, in a very interesting protein that chelates calcium and it sucks it out of coronary arteries. That might be a handy feature. We'll get to that. So we're finding out then that K2 has something to do with these because it has something to do with this calcium stuff. And it, gets, it seems to be activating these proteins. So K2 defines where calcium should and shouldn't go. So here's MGLA matrix protein and here's osteocalcin, what they look like. In 2007, the lights turn on and people go, oh dear, osteocalcin isn't rare. I mean, its deficiency isn't rare. K2 deficiency isn't rare, I mean. So there's this journal article. We suddenly realized that K2 has to be activated. And if you measure for uncarboxylated osteocalcin, oh dear, I made a mistake, uncarboxylated osteocalcin, not K2, uncarbox that's the only test we have right now for adequacy of K2. If you measure for uncarboxylated osteocalcin, everybody's at 90%. That's a problem. If you're only 10% activated, you got 90% not going on there, and that's a problem because we're meant to be putting, we're meant to be putting on, we're meant to be putting calcium into bones. Anybody here worried about having uh, their bones break when you get older? Osteoporosis an issue in America? Okay, trivia question for you: How many times do American African? We have one clear genetic relationship: African American women, and uh, Nigeria. We now know because most African American women came from Nigeria. And my apologies. If you go to Ghana or Nigeria, you can find those women very genetically close to them. What's the rate of hip fracture from Nigeria to America? 80 times, 80 times in America compared to Nigeria. So what's going on in America? It's making us break our bones. So here's this vitamin central to osteoporosis. And anybody here worried about heart disease? Right. So this is like the two major epidemics of our, some of our major epidemics of our day. And deficiency of the vitamin that's critical to both those diseases is common. In fact, it's almost universal. But that's not the whole story. Because the whole story was, somebody knew this 75 years ago. OK, who knows what's the answer to that story? Is? What's the question? Who is it? OK, we'll get to that. OK, so first of all, vitamin K deficiency, vitamin K1 deficiency is common, almost universal. Vitamin K1 deficiency. Yo, wake up, back row. <laughs> Correct, false, it's K2 that's universal. I've got to put in a couple of curveballs to wake you up. Come on. OK. We discovered that K2 deficiency was common in 2007 when we learned how to measure for the presence of uncarboxylated osteocalcin. That's true. The lights just turned on. Everybody's low. Uh-oh. Suddenly, we realized we're in trouble here. Three, osteocalcin is a protein that binds calcium in your bone. Vitamin K2 activates that protein. Right. Perfect. How come orthopedics don't do it? No, don't know this. You break a bone, they don't tell you to go on K2. Don't ask me these questions. <laughs> OK. What do you get paid more for? Spending a half hour teaching you about the physiology of this, for which you get paid an office visit, or doing a break, fixing a bone? OK, we won't go there. <laughs> Activator X. Activator X. Four years before the Nobel Prize for vitamin K was given, a researcher who didn't know he was investigating K2 called it Activator X. And he was just a little old dentist in private practice called Weston Price. How many here have heard of Weston Price? Oh, good. This is a friendly crowd. All right. This is a fun crowd. No wonder nobody heard about it, because he was from Cleveland. <laughs> but whatever goods come out of Cleveland, I'm, I'm tired of hearing Milwaukee jokes, so we're going to crack a Cleveland joke tonight. OK. So there's Weston Price. All right. Now, Weston Price has actually been called the Jar Charles Darwin of nutrition because he went around the world and observed, and he just paid attention. He's born in Canada, practiced in Cleveland for about 50 years, got to be bored with his practice. He got tired of drilling teeth in kids. And he says, there's parts of the world where people don't have cavities. 
and he was curious. So he went to all around the world taking pictures. What? How did modern humans get cavities and bad misaligned teeth? I think this is an intensely interesting topic because I grew up in India, and all my kids. I grew up in real, rural village India, and all the kids I played with, Kabaddi and Gilly Danda, I don't know anybody from India here. Okay, all the Indian games I played had perfect teeth, and they never brushed their teeth. And my mother made me brush my teeth morning and night. And I thought, why do I have to brush my teeth? The kids don't have, but they don't have cavities. Every single, well, we're going to get to, I should put that in the pop quiz later, why they had perfect teeth. Well, so this is where Weston Price went all over the world, to any place he could find where people didn't have Western food. And what he observed was they all had square faces and healthy arches in their mouths and full faith. They never had to have wisdom teeth pulled. They never got cavities. They never got tuberculosis. They didn't get cancer. They didn't have heart disease. But first of all, they had healthy teeth until they got exposed to Western food. And then first, the first thing that would come would be tooth decay and then dental arch defects and then gum disease and then heart disease and then diabetes. And then before you know it, they had all sorts of other wicked things. So doesn't he look like a nice man with not that dentist mucking around in your mouth? He just looks like a nice guy. These are the kind of pictures he took. Now, if you go onto Google, in Google, Western Price Pictures, you can get dozens of these pictures. And he looked at all these beautiful, look at her beautiful symmetrical face, nice and even, lovely teeth, lovely teeth, and still they start eating Western food. And their teeth go to hell in a handbasket. Okay? And so he asked the question, why are these people so healthy? And of course, he has thousands of pictures on his website of people showing him their teeth, which is a bit of an eccentric thing to do. But he had this newfangled thing called a camera. You know, and it was about this big. So he was hauling this great big thing all over the world, taking people's teeth, which is a little odd. He found some common threads. Food that can be transported long distance, stored without spoiling, rice, white flour, sugar, vegetable fat, canned goods, is trouble. Causing lousy teeth, crowded dental arches, cavities, da, 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 and eventually tuberculosis. And that was sort of the marker disease for him. He decided it was the absence of some essential factor. And his findings were traditional diets contained four times the mineral and water-soluble vitamins that we eat in America and ten times the fat-soluble vitamins. At that time, he didn't know K, but he knew A, D, and E. So he said, okay, I'm going to follow, I'm going to focus on the fat-soluble vitamins. So he comes back to America and that was back in 1930. So he said there's some activator, there was something in there. So he comes back to America and he makes what he calls Activator X. Has anybody here taken Activator X? Do you sell it here? It's hideously expensive. You can still purchase it on the internet from a couple of sites. Uh, an Activator X is made from two ingredients. And he found it was present in egg yolks and fish eggs and all that, and, but in organ meats. So he got the butter fat of cows eating rapidly growing green grass. So he went to the farmers of eastern Ohio and he wanted their May and June butter. Okay? And he got, he got butter oil from them and he mixed that with uh, cod liver oil. And cod liver oil has high vitamin A and vitamin D in it. So animal liver and butter. And guess what he did? He cured cavities. Anybody here never had a cavity? Can you imagine curing a cavity with a supplement? Curing. I'm going to show you pictures. He published x-rays showing that active, in fact, he stopped drilling teeth. It wasn't until 2007, though, that we made the connection with what he had found was vitamin K2. 20 cavities cured. Um, you talked about, you know, the Kerry Gold Butter. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, I was just reading online the, the butter oil. Uh-huh. Well, the grass-raised butter has the K2 in it. Right. It's just you're getting it in smaller doses. If you're going to get a food, that's what traditional people ate. They ate whole foods. Okay. And they ate, they actually, in Switzerland, he observed that they made a big hairy deal about getting the milk and butter from their cows when they were just getting the grass from the retreating ice and snow. Mm -hmm. As the cows went up to higher pastures, they would save that butter and feed it to children and pregnant women. Mm -hmm. That was one of his observations in Switzerland. But here's an example of 20 teeth, but I've got a better one. Here's one cavity. Get, it gets a filling, but now on Activator X, it's filling in itself and healing. Can you imagine? This is mind-blowing. He's curing cavities. Can you imagine curing cavities with a simple supplement? 
Well, there he was. That's what he was doing. So, pop quiz. You ready? Vitamin K was discovered in 1995, 1978, 1937, 1929. And the answer is sort of yes to all of the above. Because it was sort of the story over about 70 years where we found out and we've been learning this in little pieces. And it was really only in the 1995s we realized there was cal that, that, was, that was just connected to K2 and that we were all insufficient. So we don't need to obsess about the details. Weston Price made his activator potion from what? Grass-raised butter and cod liver oil, right? Okay, so uh, we missed on vitamin K2's action because we thought all the K's actions were about white blood counts going awry. Oh, good. That's false. It was blood clotting they were focusing on, not white blood counts. We all focused on blood clotting, and we said everybody has plenty of vitamin K, no big deal. Don't worry about it. So we missed K2's action also because we thought that K deficiency was very rare. And that's true. We thought it was rare, and so we didn't pay much attention, and we spent a whole lot of time feeding ourselves rat poison or coumadin, uh, warfarin, to thin our blood. Okay, so vitamin K1 looks like this, no double bonds in it. It is a clotting agent, warfarin blocks it, it is made by gut bacteria. It's rare to be deficient unless you're on a boatload of antibiotics. So folks in the hospital and ICUs who are getting tons and tons of antibiotics occasionally start bleeding from being deficient K1, and that's a well-known phenomenon of lots of heavy antibiotics. Okay? So that's, that's all you're going to hear about K1. But I want to introduce a, kind, a concept to you called the triage theory of Bruce Ames. So this is a 30,000 foot idea. And that is that the human body always focuses on the most critical short term missing ingredient. And that's what evolution makes us pay attention to. So is bleeding to death a bigger problem than osteoporosis? Yes. Of course. So it'll sacrifice the long term theoretical, not so immediate missing nutrient to be sacrificed for the short term. So vitamin K, if we're short on the vitamin K, your body will invest making K1 first as bleeding to death happens suddenly and quickly. So as the phrase I say, as surgeons say, all bleeding stops. Well, yes, I just don't want it to stop while I'm dead. You know, I, but heart disease happens, osteoporosis takes decades to develop. And dying from blood thinning takes many, many years, and by that time you stop passing on your genes. So K1 is a classic example of triage theory. And in my world, we have, it's a board's question, triage theory, so we had, I didn't know this stuff. So what does K2? Here's what K2 does. What does K2 do? It activates protein responsible for calcium and phosphorus deposition in bones and teeth. And I'm going to show you exactly what that molecule looks like. It directs childhood infant growth by preventing premature calcification of cartilage and bones so your face can be a full arch. So it's a critical while you're pregnant to have K2. It plays an important role in reproduction. Sperm have very high levels of osteocalcin, which is dependent on K2. Uh, in fact, indigenous societies give, uh, if they have couples getting pregnant, they all, the man also gets some of that early spring-raised butter and animal organs. It activates proteins that, cell, that cells are signaled to produce by vitamins A and D. Where, uh, that's where it, actually A and D make these proteins stimulated K2 activates those proteins. So it works in partnership with vitamin A and D. So it's not a separate vitamin. It's really integral. It's almost like there's the KAD complex. They all work together as a team. Uh, it protects mouth, teeth, and gums and saliva. So Western Price noticed a 90% reduction in some destructive bacteria in mouths of people. It protects against calcification, inflammation of blood vessels, and accumulation of plaque. It helps make myelin sheath on nerve cells. There's fascinating evidence now coming out about multiple sclerosis, about Alzheimer's, about all sorts of brain disease stuff, and K2. Yes? So plaque formation, can that reverse plaque formation in the carotid artery? Oh, yes, just, you, you, just, but you have to wait five minutes. OK? <laughs> Essential for proper facial development. Uh, I, we get to the supermodels and the beautiful faces later, but we'll talk about that. So we'll get, OK. So look at these broad, beautiful faces. Those are beautiful people. They have symmetrical faces. They aren't in our culture, but they are. And typically what we call beauty is when you take somebody's face and it's perfectly symmetrical, and we'll, I'll show you examples of that. But look at these folks. Uh-oh, something's going trouble. And the, so here's a beautiful face too, OK? <laughs> so the calcium conundrum. And I've been a vitamin D advocate in Wisconsin for years. I've gotten in trouble over it because I was one of the earlier advocates. 
And not, I remember this article coming out in April 2011, and I was sort of stymied by it because what it showed was women who take extra calcium for osteoporosis are at greater risk of heart attack. They get three fewer broken bones, but six more heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard about this about a year and a half, two years ago, and suddenly your doctor started saying, uh oh, stop taking calcium. You get plenty of calcium. You're getting eight to ten times more calcium in your diet than women in India. Women in India have denser bones than you do. And we don't, we'll get to that in a minute still. Okay, the conundrum. Too much calcium in arteries, too little in bones. Mm -hmm. Why? Both processes are caused by inadequate K2. Repeat, both processes are caused by inadequate K2. Let me repeat. Both processes are caused by inadequate. Too little in bone, too much in arteries. Both are caused by the same thing. So here's osteoporosis. This is a healthy bone. That's what half the women in this room currently have. And I bet that some of you were asked to take bisphenates by your doctor, and hopefully you were brave enough to say no. And as you get older, how many women do you know start doing this? And then you can't take a good deep breath. How many women do you know walk around like this when they get to be 85 and they can look to the side? So all of you who have a good straight back, just look at this way. From here on out, you're never going to have this because we just stopped this for you. This stops right here because you're going to be on K2 after you leave tonight. I told Dan, you better have a lot of K2 here tonight <laughs> because people are going to be buying five vials each. Yes? <laughs> this process stops here. No, it doesn't reverse. But it, from this, it gets worse. From this, it gets worse and worse and worse, and then you die. So if wherever it is, stopping it is helpful wherever you are. So it's never, as long as you're alive, it's never harmful to stop it. Is K2 really a vitamin or is it a hormone? Ah, actually vitamin D is very much like a hormone. You can make the, you can make the argument. It's really, uh, it has, it, it doesn't turn on DNA synthesis. It acts like a vitamin by activating. It is a factor that activates proteins. It's a cofactor. Right, it's a cofactor. So it really is sort of a vitamin. So this is what's happening to you as your spine settles. Instead of this nice healthy square vertebrae, when you have 20 of these lined up, then you get a curve, and that curve gets worse and worse and worse. Okay? So you, we've all seen this happen to all of our loved ones, our grandmothers, our aunts, and, our, and ourselves a little bit. You know, every, all of us are a little bit worried that we're starting to bend a little. Okay? And then what's the number one risk of dying prematurely for women over age 65? Is it a heart attack, is it a stroke, or is it a fall? And the answer is a fall. And in fact, in half of women, the fracture happens before the fall. It's actually the fracture happens because you're walking down and putting weight on it, and it's so weak, and then you fall because you can't, the bone doesn't have any integrity anymore. Okay, what does K2 do? It activates by putting on a carbon dioxide on the end of a glutamic acid. So it adds an extra gut negative group, so that a calcium can fit right in there. So that's called gamma carboxylation. What that makes is it's making a claw so it can chelate calcium, because it's got a negative charge and a negative charge here, and calcium's got two positive charges and fits perfectly in the middle. So that's what, osteo that's what vitamin K does. It activates that. That's it. So for those of you who are still awake, you can now take your nap because you've seen it. Okay? <laughs> Pop quiz. The calcium conundrum is we get calcium in our bones and not in our arteries. That's backwards. You've been texting. So, okay. That's backwards. Right, good. So you picked that up. Two major proteins that K2 activates are called osteocalcin and MGA pro MGP, you can call it MGP, MGLA protein. American women break their hips at 50 times the rate of women in less industrialized societies. Well, true, but actually 80 times. And if you compare Norwegian and Scandinavian women with fine bones, a.k.a. if you can put your finger around your wrist and your fingers overlap, all the women here, put your fingers, if your fingers overlap, you are a fine-boned woman. Comparing you, to women, <laughs> comparing you to women who live indigenously in New Guinea, the rate of fracture for you is 1,100 to 1. So 80 to 1 is a... That's actually pretty good. We have a runaway epidemic of osteoporosis in America. This is a criminal epidemic. 
Americans get shoulder as they grow older because they are lacking K1. Oh, good, you've been paying attention because their bones settle, probably caused by K2. And this is the same picture with blood clotting. It's actually the same activation in blood clotting, but it's just a different set of proteins. So osteocalcin is one of the most abundant proteins in our bones. A and D cause osteoblasts to make more osteocalcin. So these two act like a hormone because they turn on DNA synthesis. But this is what it looks like, and here's the chelating effect. And then, so you get osteocalcin, and then once you've got it activated, it can plug calcium into bone. Okay? That's really that simple. It's just that simple. The problem is, is that's not all osteocalcin does. Turns out your pancreas has an incredibly high level of osteocalcin in it, and it helps you lower your insulin 20 to 36 percent. We don't know why those two have a connection. Why do bones and pancreas? Heavens knows, but that's what we see. So in fact, K2 has a dramatic impact on lowering insulin. So I have a father who's 89 years old and struggling with his diabetes. His blood sugar is 190. I put him on K2 three months ago, and his blood sugar has been 110 to 120 for the last couple of weeks. He dropped his blood sugar 60 to 70 points on everything else being stable. <clears throat> Okay, osteocalcin and male fertility. It helps regulate testosterone production, helps ser sperm survive. Like I say, in traditional societies, the couple's trying to get pregnant, the guy gets extra, he gets, they get the organ meat, the pancreas and the adrenals and the... Anybody here eating a pancreas lately? <laughs> Have you ever gone down to El Rey? That's the only place you can find them. You can't find them in, in Pick and Save. Can you imagine going to Pick and Save or to Sendex and finding a pancreas? You know. It's actually probably most of them made into dog meat. Uh, matrix GLA protein escorts calcium out of blood vessels. We've known for years that the plaque in an artery in your carotid artery, plaques in arteries are universally 20% calcium. Why? In fact, your artery of your wall starts looking, your artery wall starts looking like it's got a bone element to it. So we K, you're having hardening of the arteries? You are. The arteries lost its stretch. It's becoming rigid and inflexible. This is happening in coronary arteries, in aorta, in carotids, in kidney arteries, and all over. Matrix GLA protein chelates it in the artery and pulls it out. So there's the same thing. Now what's interesting is you put people on warfarin, which blocks K effect everywhere, and in the ER, you know what? I can tell somebody on warfarin, because I do a chest x-ray on them, and you know what you see? All their arteries are outlined perfectly because you can see the calcium in the walls. Anybody here want your arteries to look like your lead pipes everywhere? That's what happens to somebody. Now, Coumadin is a life-saving, critically important drug. My father's on Coumadin. He is also taking 45 milligrams a day of K2 and being supervised by his pharmacist at their Coumadin clinic who says, I've never heard of this before. I said, call me. Okay? Uh, uh, the calcium life cycle is interesting. We now know that you build up calcium during the arterial plaque and calcium builds up in the winter and diminishes in the summer. What's happening in the summer? Vitamin D is going up. And if you're getting any K2 in your diet, the only chance to get it is going to be in May, June, and July, eating animal products that were made in April, May, and June. Okay? Because that's the only time we get it. But we've known that cycle for quite a while. So what went wrong? How did we become deficient? What did Austin Price observe? They were eating grass-raised animal products. What happened to America? Anybody have any grass-raised animal products here? This is what you're eating. See the grass in this picture? See the grass in this picture? John, I think there's a, there's a vendor at Brookfield <clears throat> Green Market that's selling God bless him. Please come to Brookfield Farmer's Market. Or where? He calls it organic, but he said it's, it's grass raised. Well, there are vendors around, and I know at, Brook, at uh, the Brookfield Farmer's Market that's over by the library uh, at, at Ruby Isle, two blocks from my office. There's a farmer there. In fact, if you buy $45, he'll deliver to your house. Yeah, so please come there and, and use him, because we've got to get some, we've got to start getting his food supply changed. How's your back? 
Are you straight? How's your bones? You know, yes, we might be. You might be getting some. You look like you have lovely posture. So far, so good. <laughs> you know, we just don't know because there's just there's so little research on this. We just don't know yet. I, you know, this is this 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 picture is opened up, and we're just learning. We're just learning. Here's our pigs. You know, no grass for the pigs, no grass for the cow. So what difference? No grass, no sunlight, no dirt, no arti just artificial feed. We thought it was omega-3 fatty acids, but in fact, it wasn't just the omega-3 fatty acids. It was a K2, because K1 comes along. So our food supply has radically changed in the last 50 years, and we've had this uh, 70 years, and we've had this epidemic of disease show up. And so we really missed the phenomenon because we were thinking that all you needed was protein and fat and, you know. So in some of the, which, like in the <clears> appendix of something they list as grass-fed, are we believing that that's truly grass-fed or range-free? Is that what it would have to be? You Do we know of any inspection or? process? It's, we're going on trust. It doesn't mean it doesn't have antibiotics in it. So if it doesn't say organic, I wouldn't buy it. Indigenous populations tended to eat grass-raised animals that they hunted. Or they were herders. So in my village in India, it was a relatively poor village, average farm size, three acres, but every family owned two cows. And those cows were pretty pathetic little things. They had udders about this big, you know, and they'd make about a glass of milk a day each, and they'd sleep in the house with their owners. The owners actually used their cow dung more than they used their milk because they needed the cow dung for fuel. But those little pathetic cows would walk around all day long finding every blade of grass they could find and a couple banana peels and a couple, you know, anything they could eat. But they were making grass and they were getting K2. And I'm realizing, oh my gosh, that's why my friends in childhood had such perfect teeth. I, I'm, you know, now I look back on that. So children fed organ meat and butter before adults, living outdoors with much more sunshine, no artificial oils or trans fats, much less salt, abundant vegetables. We're not sure which of these was more important. This just sounds like the whole food we know should, we should be eating. So, John, you get, you get K2 out of the liver? Uh, you get a vitamin A out of the liver. Uh, actually, mammals, mammary glands, so make K2. I have not seen any research about human mammary glands, only cow mammary glands. But a, a breastfeeding mother, is that making K2? I don't know. I haven't seen that. You know, but here's where you find K1. K1 is right here by the chloroplast, right there. So K1 is in green grass. So spring grass, for those of you who are maying, mowing every three days now because the grass is suddenly finally growing so quickly you have to sort of beat at it for a while, okay? That's where K1 comes from, and we turn K1 into K2. So animals that get K2, they can convert it. So grazing animals, animals accumulate it in their, their meat, and we just don't have the research to know where that K2 is coming from. Yes? Would chlorella have K1 in it? I haven't a clue. be interesting research. Might. So you are what you eat, but you are also what your animals eat. So this kind of makes a compelling discussion that we probably shouldn't be completely pure vegan unless we have some source of K2. And the fact is, there are choices. So what foods have K2 in them? Well, they're foods that are yellow, because yellow means they're getting omega-3 fatty acids. So they're bright yellow. So Holly and I went to visit our son in Geneva, Switzerland. He couldn't see us for three days, so we had to hang out in Paris. Uh, and it rained for three days, so we sat in restaurants eating, you know, whatever we could do and we could occupy the table. And we noticed they kept putting ice on their butter. We thought, that's interesting. And Holly took, you know, we took a roll, one of, that, one of the marvelous little hard French rolls, and she put the butter in her purse. <laughs> Guess what happened to her butter? It's got so much omega-3 fatty acid, and it's not solid at room temperature. And it melted. It made a mess in her purse. <laughs> American butter, you can steal a pat of American butter from any old restaurant. It'll last for weeks in your purse. Just don't, <laughs> just don't squish it. Because in America, we feed our cows cottonseed oil so that our butter doesn't melt at room temperature, so you can leave it on the dining room table. The French don't like that flavor. They're picky about their butter. They want grass-raised butter. So guess how many heart attacks the French have? Half of American. So research finding. For egg, for example, eggs, two different kinds of eggs. Grass-raised chicken eggs have 25% less saturated fat, two-thirds more A, double the omega fats, three times the vitamin E, 50% more folate, 70% more B12, 
much more vitamin D, 30% less cholesterol, more K2. You know, we're, it's which nutrients are more important. So pop quiz. K1 is found naturally in green grass right next to the chloroplast. True. Good. It is changed into K2 in animal guts and mammary glands. True. True. I'm going to make you nervous here. Grass-raised chickens have, mo have more vitamin A, more omega fats, more folate, more B12, more D, uh, less cholesterol, more... Oh, gad, spelling, sorry. That E got transported. Uh, yes, 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 and yes. Okay. Indigenous societies and prices which always fed their children, pregnant mothers, high-value animal organ food. True. Well, they fed their organ meats, too, or, which to us sounds yucky, you know, eating pancreases and adrenal glands and, you know. So trans fats. What do trans fats do? 9% of America's calories come from trans fats. Every one of us here is doing our best probably not to eat them, but we all every now and then soften up and have a few french fries at McDonald's or whatever. Trans fats do something. They do an odd number on K2, and they completely flip it over. And they turn it into a chemical called dihydrocolone, which has turned out to be an unbelievably useful marker for poor quality food. So when you're doing research, you can go looking for this stuff and find it, and it's a measure of how lousy that food is. Mm -hmm. I suspect McDonald's and any fast food joint would be quite high on DHP. But trans fats turn vitamin K2, and they turn it around like this. It gets sort of transported this way. <coughs> so here's again this K, the K family, and here's DHP that it gets uh, curled up. Uh, And you can just see these are the differences. Now, this is the human form. This is the bacterial form that's made by natto. Uh, so the question is, where does K2 come from in foods? Well, natto has a huge amount of K2 in it, but that's MK7. The French like their goose liver pâté. So when you ask about liver, does liver have K2 in it? This, but it has to be, now geese eat grass. So I'm thinking of going to Elm Grove Pond after dark and just uh, <laughs> picking up, because, because Lord knows what they're leaving on the sidewalk. You know, I would be considered a hero in Elm Grove. If you look at French and Dutch cheeses, they have K2 in them. But you get down to American cheese, there's not much left. Chicken legs and meat, so there are some indication that meat has some in it. And if you want roughly in the range of 100 microunits a day, you're going to have to eat six chicken legs or... How much are we supposed to have a day? K2? We don't know. So anybody here ever eat natto? Okay. Does anybody have... Did you enjoy it? If anybody wants to sort of have a little yucky, funny, funny time, go on to YouTube and look up Eating Natto for the First Time. <laughs> it's, I think it's sort of like the cinnamon challenge. You know, it's like... Well, we'll get to that. I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think actually natto has been found. Dan found me a research article showing that it doesn't activate some of the clotting proteins as effectively as MK4 does. So really it might be MK4 you want because that's the actual human. But here's the natto story. See this gooey stuff? This is natto. And here's the story. The year's 1080. Two Japanese armies in Japan are facing each other, ready for battle, but the two sets of soldiers are cooking some soybeans for their, for their horses. And the trumpets call, and they've got to go off to battle, so they douse the fire, and they throw the soybeans in a sack of straw, and they throw the straw, and, you know, hide it, and off they go. Three days of battle later, they come back, and they're starving. They haven't eaten for three days, and they remember those soybeans. If you haven't eaten for three days, even natto tastes delicious. Okay? And they said, this is tasty. Guess what happens? Women from Tokyo and northeast in Japan eat natto. Women from Osaka and down don't. In fact, they think those northern Japanese are crazy. They say that stuff tastes horrible. Guess who has more hip fractures? Right. Uh, so the question is, how much K do we need? We don't know. There's no good research about it. There was a consensus meeting in Europe in 2004, but Americans haven't done anything, so nobody knows. All we know is things like if you look at the top third of MK4, you have as much as a 57% risk reduction from death from heart attack for people in the top third of... That's just from heart attack. You know, and so we're observing, 
we're just at the beginning of a story, and I believe over the next 15 years, the story will be cemented down, and 20 years from now, we'll have guidelines. 20 years from now, I'll give you a good, clear answer. If you got 20 years to spare, yeah. I haven't got 20 minutes, so in my case, I'm a little nervous about waiting 20 years. So what's the dose? My belief is MK4 is what animals naturally make, and there's pretty good evidence that you can stop the calcification on people on Coumadin on just 45 micrograms a day. 45 might be enough. And so for those of you who are closest, MD Custom makes 45 microgram capsules right over there. <laughs> right? Are you making your own now? So it's available? I think, yeah, MD Custom has, for example. We, we have Do you have milligrams or micrograms? Micrograms. Okay, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Sorry. Okay. Micrograms. This is micrograms. 45 milligrams would be a lot more. Yeah. Right. Micrograms. This is tiny dose. The thought is it's thought to only last a few hours, but the chemical effect might last much, much longer because you're activating proteins. So you might not need it to last, you know, 24-7. So we just don't know if that matters. And some people say you may have to take it three times a day, but I doubt that. I doubt you. I suspect what you do is you activate proteins and you get its effect. And those proteins last for a couple of days or whatever. Alternatively, MK from 7, one day dosing does a great job, but we're not sure it activates all the same proteins. We're pretty sure it doesn't activate some critical bone-related proteins. So I'm sort of thinking, so Life Extension is the first company to put out a combination of MK7, MK4, and, K, and K1, and they call it Super K. So there's some companies now putting out combination just because we don't know. So this is going to be the story we'll see being played out in the next couple of years. And for a postmenopausal woman, you could say for MK7, maybe 240 micrograms is enough, but we just don't really know. Pop quiz. The highest source of K2 is a food called natto, a delicious preparation of soybeans from Japan. Okay, that would be true on concentration, maybe not so good on flavor. Uh, trans fats reinforce and multiply the effect of K2. And that's false. Absolutely annihilates it. Okay? There are clear guidelines for K supplementation. False. It's in flux, but clear we need more, and there needs to be special caution with folks on Coumadin who need to have blood thinning with K2. Uh, a, ru a reasonable dose might be 45 micrograms of K MK4, and that's roughly, that's the best we know. Okay? So other effects. I'm going to go through real quickly here, and then we'll just do questions. But I want you to just see these ideas. Uh, we know it inhibits osteoclasts that break bone down. We know in menopause it helps, and particularly, break up IL-6. We know... Uh, in transplant patients, the most difficult fracture patients of all. Transplant patients have a terrible time with fra fractured bones. That's, this is the only supplement we found that, you know, 34 times the rate that K2 now is cutting down that fracture rate. Uh, on osteocalcin, we can activate osteocalcin incredibly potently. And uh, K1 doesn't do it. K2 keeps doing it every day, every day in a study for 40 days. It keeps activating osteocalcin. Uh, Alzheimer's disease. There's a strong association between osteoporosis and Alzheimer's and a strong association in blood levels for folks with Alzheimer's. We know that K2 helps your brain myelinate itself and keep the, the cells wrapped properly. So everything else doesn't matter to me if it comes to Alzheimer's. So that should be the reason we're taking it because skin wrinkles. Do you know that there's a linear... Well, I've tell you this story. I tell my wife, this is with permission, I tell my wife about reducing coronary artery disease, and she's reading a magazine. She goes, uh-huh. I tell her about reducing uh, osteoporosis, and she keeps reading the magazine, turns the page, says, uh-huh. I say, and it cuts down skin wrinkles on a linear basis, and she puts her magazine down. She says, can I come get some? <laughs> so you've got to know your customer. So, <laughs> you know. But there's a linear relationship. If you do biopsies, on, if you do a picture and do a microscopic picture of somebody's face and count the wrinkles and measure their vitamin K2 level, linear relationship. So vanity is a wonderful thing. If it motivates you to do it, go for it. But you see that women who eat natto have less wrinkles as they age. And now there's a disease called pseudoxanthum elasticum. Basically, it's called wrinkles from hell. Uh, they've got horrible, horrible wrinkles. We found out the mechanism. They've got horrible MGP protein that's never activated. That's what causes this disease. And so the, now there are studies going on. What happens if we give them very high doses of K2 we don't know because by the time you're 30 years old, you look 150. Uh, varicose veins, uh, 
It does clear that MGP is the presence of the walls of veins, and if we can cut it down, oh dear, here's another typo, that's MGB. If it isn't activated, it contributes to remodeling of the vein wall. Uh, diabetes. Your pancreas has some of the highest level in your body, and we now know that if you take di young men who are diabetic and put them on, oh, we've, there's a mechanism. If you take one man and put them, young men and put them on uh, K2 on a, on a metabolic ward, you can show that their production of insulin drops in half. The lower your level of insulin, the less your fat cells are motivated to take up fat as calories. And so you want a low level of insulin. You want to be producing less insulin. Uh, in Japan, they virtually inversely, the basically K2 status is inversely related to the amount of insulin-resistant diabetes, suggesting it's also helpful in insulin-dependent diabetics. In rheumatoid arthritis, the same thing about their joints with heart disease. There's been a strong correlation between severity of heart disease and rheumatoid arthritis for multiple sclerosis and brain health. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Every tissue in our body has, has the need for proper calcium metabolism. Cancer cells, the EPIC study from Europe, 24,000 people followed for 10 years. Results, those with the highest K had 30% less cancer. That's almost the exact same rate as the highest D level. And you go, oh my gosh. It's a partner with vitamin D. It's really not in isolation. It should be a partner with it. Uh, so you can see the same thing. Okay, pop quiz. The EPIC study from Europe showed a 30% reduction in cancer from folks with the highest K2 intake. True. Diabetes is helped by K2. True. Uh, wrinkles are associated with lower K2 levels. True. They're associated with lower K2 levels, right? Bone density improves the most resistant patients of all dialysis patients when they take K2. See, I'm fooling you because I put all four trues. You're expecting me to be a, be a stinker and put in a false there just to fool you. See, four trues. But those are all true. And when you start realizing there's a huge impact on many, many diseases. So more on cancer. There's lung disease. There's kidney disease. There's fertility. Uh, so women who, are, who can't get pregnant, I just put it today, I put a woman who couldn't, couldn't get pregnant on K2. And she was delighted. She says, this has to be it, because everything else we're told is all normal. And she says, we're certainly practicing enough. <laughs> you know. OK, who knows who this person is? I called her Kate Moss, and my wife ripped me up when she says, that's not Kate Moss, that's? Cindy Crawford. Who? Cindy Crawford. Cindy Crawford. Yes. She's, a She's a supermodel. Yeah. She's got a gorgeous, beautiful, symmetrical face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gwyneth Paltrow, People Magazine last week, most beautiful woman on this planet, symmetrical face. Western Price, the symbol for his, his organization is two broad faces with a narrow face in the middle. K2, when, you're, when mom's pregnant with you, allows your nasal cartilages to form fully so that your face widens and becomes wider. If you have inadequate K2, your face gets narrower and narrower and then 30 years later, you have cavities. So here's two sisters. This sister never had K2 as a little girl. Look at her teeth, OK? Weston Price comes back and says, well, I'm going to treat your mother while she's pregnant on, their, on your other sister. Her other sister got K2. Look at her teeth. Perfect symmetry. Look at the width of her face. Look at the width of her face. Can you see the difference? Uh, so price is prenatal food formula, milk, green vegetables, seafood, lots of organs of animal meat, cod liver oil, butter from grass-raised cows. That was what he used to give folks before they got pregnant. But he came back, and basically he stopped drilling teeth. So here, you can actually take an, and reduce beauty in men and women to the Fibonacci sequence. And if every here ever heard of the Fibonacci sequence, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is it's the magic formula, 1.61 that the Parthenon, the, the pyramids, all things beautiful that seem symmetrical to us actually fit. Uh, seashells are on the Fibonacci sequence. Flowers are based on the Fibonacci sequence. It's nature's nat natural mathematical formula. All the data here fits Fibonacci sequence data. So beautiful people, we know them when we see them. They look beautiful. Guess what happens when you take K2? Son number one, look at his face. She has adequate K2 because it's first child. Son number two, uh-oh, see his narrow little face? There's research that shows second children born within three years have narrower faces, need more teeth taken out, have more problems with cavities and arch defects because mom 
gave birth and she didn't have enough K2 to share with the baby because she was so critically deficient because she wasn't eating enough pancreases or whatever, wherever that K2 comes from. So here's the symbol of the Western Price Organization, the broad faces and labor and delivery. Every indigenous society around this planet has stories of women who literally go behind a bush and 20 minutes later come back with a baby, have no trouble with labor and delivery. In Alaska, the doctor Romig, who was the OB to the Inuit for like 30 years, said he never made it to a native delivery until they started getting Western food. Once they started getting Western food, they'd take two days to deliver just like Western women did. Now, who knows what that means? That's just an association. The thought is, we know that vitamin D is a critical missing ingredient, but K is probably its partner, and we're thinking that may play part of it. So strong bones, uh, again, another story about strong bones, strong teeth. We can show that it uh, makes a difference to the dentin. That's what K Price was observing. But he also noticed that pill folks without K2 had 323,000 lactobacillus per ml in their saliva. After taking K2, it dropped 95%. Lactobacillus is what causes cavities. So K2 has an antibiotic effect in your mouth and lowers the cavities in your mouth. Uh, salivary changes, they were here somewhere on the salivary changes. So his formula was basically cod liver oil, boil, stop drilling teeth. So Sir Edward Mellonby in England also started doing that. He became friends with, Kate, with Price and he was curing cavities. So it wasn't just Western Price curing cavities. Mellonby was doing this in England and also duplicated it and also published the data about that. The question is, how do you measure it? Well, there is no test except for uncarboxylated osteocalcin. And so you can re measure that ratio, and the ratio should be about here. I have found only one place in Ms. Milwaukee that was do will do that test. That's Frederick Hospital. And boy, they gave me a hard time doing it. They had to send it out somewhere. So I ordered it, got the result. But it's apparently still hard to do. Uh, here's a DEXA cardiac calcium scan. I'm now using K2 in my practice of reversing coronary artery disease. I've got about, oh, 50 patients now. I've got on K2 to help lower their calcium scans on their arteries. But this really a symphony. These three vitamins all work together. And if you don't have enough A, D picks up. And if you don't have enough D, A picks up. You probably should have both of them. And they work together with uh, K2 to then activate bones. Uh, I don't want to go into all that detail. There's sort of a switch model. Depending on which you have, one goes to the other. But this is the most important one to tell you about. For those who don't get my email, and for those who would like to, you can sign up for free. I've got a list here if you want to sign up my email. This was about three weeks ago I published this study. The Combs study was done in November last year from Canada, and it stands for Combination of Micronutrients for Bones. And what they found was 77 volunteer women. It was not a randomized placebo-controlled trial. It was 77 volunteers. Okay, took K2, 100 micrograms of MK7, 2,000 units of vitamin D, magnesium a little bit, uh, some strontium. Uh, you have strontium here, don't you? You must have strontium. I've seen strontium here. Uh, no dietary calcium only, no supplementary calcium, and a little bit of fish oil and exercise. In one year, the women taking the K2 had their bone density go up 4%. Bisphonates, the best bisphonates ever do is 2% increase. Most of the time you get just basically break even. So here we have something that doubles the effectiveness of bisphonates with no toxicity, one-tenth the cost, and twice the efficacy. So I had a financial advisor in my office who's a woman, and she looks me straight in the eye and she says, I'm going to tell all my customers to sell their stock. She says, this is the end of the bisphonate industry, isn't it? She said, it's been pretty lucrative. And I said, yeah, but there's really nobody out there advertising it except 40 people at a time, people like me doing this. There's nobody out there advocating for this stuff. So I said, it's going to take years because there's an unbelievable amount of advertising. Sally Fields goes on TV with her you know, little spandex and my taking care of her precious little body. And <laughs> you know. So conclusion. K2 is a critical vitamin that has missed the radar. We lost it because it was confused with K1 and blood clotting. It involves calcium metabolism, pulling it out of arteries where it shouldn't be, and into bones where it should be. It helps myriad other functions as well. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, labor and delivery, all are associated with deficiency. 
I promise you, you're going to see research coming out over the next 10 years. It's going to be a fun story. I am looking forward to it because I think there's just thousands of questions to be answered. Uh, the wellness model requires lifetime balance and support, of, so treatment after disease begins is likely less useful. Proof of effect on food takes decades, but there is no toxicity. A prudent response would be, you ought to probably be on vitamin K2. You and everybody you know and everybody you love and care for. So this should be 100% of us. Yes? Um, if somebody's on Plavix or has an elevated uh, platelet count, would that count? Uh, if somebody's on Plavix or has an elevated platelet count, uh, elevated platelet counts uh, are th associated with cancer sometimes. Uh, so you always want to investigate why somebody has elevated. But Plavix is a blood thinner. And I'd say anytime you're on a blood thinner, you ought to be supervised by a doctor who pays attention and watches what's going on. But uh, we do know that I have my father, who's on Coumadin and has an INR of 2.5. On he started on MK4, and his Coumadin did not his INR did not change one iota. So, anecdote case of one. <laughs> yes. Is there any evidence for uh, increased eye health? Any evidence for increased eye health? I can't believe there won't be. Okay. I can't believe there won't be. I think this is like vitamin D. This is going to end up affecting every organ system in our body. You know. But most of all, I want you to have a lovely straight back and clean coronary arteries. Though, you know, start with that, and then lowering your insulin helps, and a little bit of less Alzheimer's wouldn't be so bad you know, while we're at it. You know. Yes? Two questions. Um, does it help with post-chemo neuropathy? Peripheral neuropathy. Well, post-chemo, though. Not oh, post-chemo post neuropathy. Yeah. It rewraps nerves. It's critical to the rewrapping of nerves. So uh, we don't know. Okay. Wouldn't it be fun if it did? You're going to call me up if it does. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. One, one more oh, sure. Or different question. So what was the test on carboxylated? Uncarboxylated osteocalcin. The osteocalcin is the protein that it activates, and uncarboxylated is, you know, how much isn't there. Okay. okay? Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. Do you think the K2 might be a good idea for him? Um, I said? personally think the bisphosphonates are poisons. I yeah, won't yeah. give them to anybody. You, know, you get into the medical system and they just scare you to death and well, don't take it. No. I think, uh, write down the Comb study. You can Google it. If you want, I'll go on my website. You can find it on my website, newsandnutrition.com. You can get the hyperlink right to the study and show that to the doctor and say, here we've got a study. And you know what they'll say? Oh, this isn't a randomized placebo-controlled trial. That's true. It's just a pilot study. But show me a pilot study of 77 women that have a 4% increase in bone density. And I'll just, you know, there has never, ever, ever been a randomized placebo-controlled trial of parachutes either. <laughs> Some things are so patently obvious, you ought to just say, look at what's happening. Let's just do it. You know, so we're now, you know, th this game of you have to, do, have to do absolutely everything we do and we have to wait until it's a completely randomized placebo control of 100,000 patients. That applies to things that are toxic drugs, mm -hmm. to nutrients that are part of the normal human food chain. Oh, give me a break. So it can do no harm. It can do no harm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. A couple questions. So can you reverse EP with vitamin K2, varicose veins, and gum disease? Well, I've got an N of one at home right now working on it. <laughs> <laughs> my spouse. <laughs> well, I, no, I don't know sure she has gum disease, she do, but she does need a root canal at the moment, so she's hoping desperately this will pick up real fast. <laughs> there is a, I've had about 15 patients in my practice who, there's pretty good evidence that K2 prevents you getting any toxicity from vitamin D. And there's a rather odd man who's, a, he's kind of a thought leader, but he's written a book called the miraculous results of very, very, of super high doses of vitamin D. And what he details is putting people on 20,000 to 50,000 units of vitamin D, and you'll never get toxic as long as you're on vitamin K in addition. Okay. Right. So I have a man who came into my office about three months ago. I put on this formula. I showed him the book. You can get, you can get the book on your Kindle for $1.99. <laughs> it's a little hard to read because he's sort of a scatterbrained kind of guy. But I showed him the book, and I had a man who came to me because his doctor wanted to do shoulder surgery on him. And he has horrible pain in his shoulder, and he's right-handed, and he can't use his right arm. 
Eight weeks later, he's completely pain-free, his shoulder's better. My wife, Holly, has been uh, spent five, the last five years fighting a degenerating knee. She has been going to the gym and getting very careful physical therapy. She has had, an, she's had her, the knee operated on and cartilage whacked out. And the arthropod looks at her and says, well, I suppose you need a total knee. I started her on 20,000 units of vitamin D and K2 uh, three months ago. And yesterday, she ran down a hill with me. We were getting away from the train because we were crossing the railway track illegally. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but she hasn't run down that hill for five years. And she says her pain's completely gone. No, she's taking uh, Life Extensions, M K, uh, Super K. And, and you said the test for that um, um, carboxylated osteocrator was doing it, the Dynacare lab? That was Dynacare. was the only place that did it, but it took me a little bit of shouting, screaming, and yelling because she'd never heard of it, and I had to ask and beg and plead and ask her to look, and they said, well, they sort of say, well, we'll get any test a doctor orders, okay. but I'm not on staff there. If you can chase it down and figure it out, God bless you. It's just, I personally, I would encourage everybody to try to get it. I'm not sure anybody will pay for it. It's probably expensive, but there now are a couple of functional medicine labs that have just started offering it. I had a drug rep come by and say, oh, we're offering it now. So they're beginning to be offered. It's starting to penetrate as people ask for it. You know, it's a marketplace. As you ask for it, people will start doing it. You know, five years ago, they were making f jokes about me and all the vitamin D levels I was ordering. You know. We don't know. We just don't know. I just want you on it. Yeah. I just, so, yeah, I mean, I th I'm fascinated with this whole idea that, you know, the French paradox. Does anybody hear what the French paradox is? This has been a lot of teeth gnashing in American cardiology for the last 50 years because the French are just degenerate. Every food they eat is starts, ingredient number one is butter. And they have half the heart disease we do. And suddenly it's like, bingo. They're eating grass-raised butter. They've got half the heart disease we do. This is not a trivial issue. So they can get away with eating butter and have no heart disease. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So that's not as good as Who knows? Butter. Who knows? All I know is Holly had a little gooey mess in the bottom of her purse. <laughs> you know? yeah. Do medications interfere with the absorption of K2? Do medications inhibit the absorption of K2? These are the kind of questions we're going to find out because we know that medications dramatically reduce vitamin D. You know, seizure medications just wipe out vitamin D inside you. So I mean, we know that there's many medications deplete many nutrients. And we know that trans fats totally screw up you know, K2. So I suspect there's gonna, we're going to find some medications that mess up K2, but this, is, this story is going to be played out. We haven't, I mean, this is so new, nobody knows yet. So are you suggesting that we take the, that, the, the K2, or K4, or the Super K, with, say, cod liver oil at the same time to make it more effective? Should we take them both at the, with K2 and vitamin A and vitamin D? Uh, I think we eat food when we eat food. I'll say take it at a meal. I think we're used to, our, our bodies are used to sorting things out when you, get a whole, when you get a whole protein. There's some anecdotal stories, a couple cases that are fascinating. Uh, uh, one, per, one particular case, for example, of a bicuspid aortic valve that had got calcified and completely solidified. And it, you know, your aortic valve is meant to have three cusps. And it opens and your heart pushes blood out to the whole body. So it has to deal with the most pressure of all. And then it snaps back shut. Well, about five, two to five percent of us, something like that, are born with one, with only two cusps instead of three. We only have two. Those folks, inevitably, that thing starts getting calcified and it turns a little chunk of calcium and then you have blood squirting out and then refluxing back in again. So that poor heart has to really work hard. Those folks eventually have to have help heart valve replacement surgery. There's one anecdotal case of a person who started on K2 and after one year his heart was back to fun his valve was back to functioning normally again. It sucks calcium out of our arteries and valves. So I mean, who knows? This story just going I think is gonna keep playing out. We're just seeing little hints and anecdotes in first line. Yeah, yes. What about um, taking calcium supplements then for men or for women? Thou should not be taking calcium. No, not any. Forget it. Stop. Don't do it. Oh really? Right. I personally believe that. 
uh, you should be eating spinach. You get plenty of calcium from spinach. You should be drinking milk, but don't take calcium. You get plenty of calcium in your diet. The calcium doesn't know what to do with itself. What you need is something to do it. You just got to have the K2 to do it. You're getting plenty. Women in India have an eighth the calcium intake that we have in America, and they have denser bones. I have a friend in a rural hospital in India that I grew up with who last year asked me to, no, oh, about five years ago, no, it wasn't last year. He's, a, he's at a hospital responsible for about two million people in eastern Orissa State, which is sort of like saying uh, West Virginia in America. He's really in the boondocks. And he asked me if I could find a used hip prosthesis because he had seen a broken hip. Two million people. He had seen a broken wow. hip. Well, I had visuals of me walking through Forest Home Cemetery late at <laughs> night <laughs> because I figure every other grave has a, bro has a you know. <laughs> and I didn't know what I'd tell the police except that it was for a charitable cause. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, I said, oh, gee, I, you know, he's hooked up with email, and I said, oh, gee, I don't think I can get you a used one because they usually get buried. You know, I don't know how we <laughs> get it. <laughs> but he's a frugal sort, and he would, of course, reuse that hip. <laughs> I thought, oh, dear. But the fact is, every, uh, for 19 years at St. Luke's, I couldn't name you one shift that I worked there where we didn't see a broken hip. I mean, virtually every shift we'd work. You know. Yes. You were on a... Unless I misunderstood, we were, um, one of your earlier letters indicated we should take calcium with vitamin D at the same time because it helps the calcium be absorbed better. Ah, Not you're remembering back to, you're, re you're reflecting back to where I was about two and a half years ago, or three years ago, and the study from Creighton University, let me give everybody a study. A study from Creighton University where they got a $25 million grant to do a 30-year study. And what's the $25 million to an academic doctor is what? That's called tenure, right? Because you've got, you've got job security for life because you've got a million dollars a year for 30 years to follow. Their goal was to get to 2,000 women who are 40 and 50 years old and give them vitamin D, 1,100 units, and a gram of calcium a day. And take that good memory. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, and they stopped the study after three years after it got to 650 women, like 300 in each group, because the women in the vitamin D group, only 1,100 units of vitamin D, had a 76% less cancer than the women who were getting placebo. So that was calcium and vitamin D together. That was a, that's a huge, that's just a huge win. And that was one of, that study today is still being quoted hundreds and hundreds of places. So I think that's one of the compelling studies to say why we need vitamin D, because vitamin D helps immature cells turn into mature cells, which are AKA aren't cancer. Uh, but I think the story, uh, my attitude changes when I saw the British Medical Journal article about how we're getting more coronary artery disease. But now my attitude changes again. We find out it's K2. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like we're suddenly realizing Another, it's like putting on different glasses and the world is suddenly green instead of blue. But D too is, but D is still important. D is still critically important. I don't want you to stop taking the D. Okay. Yeah, D activates the production of all these proteins. K2 activates the proteins. So they work together in an incredible synchronicity. And all these re prior researches were done on people with variable amounts of K2 intake and nobody knew. Were they high K or were they low K? They were just a random mix. Now we're going to have to ask the question, what happens when you get folks with a high K and the high D? Do they have even less cancer than folks who are? Because those kind of questions haven't been asked. So the cows eat grass, which is K1. Right. And it converts into K K2. Right. Okay. In the milk. In their milk. Right. So what do you recommend? Dehydroxy levels? Yes. Yeah, uh, um, it is my humble opinion that the good Lord or nature, however you want to define it, made us in a perfect way. And that was so go to places where people before who prior to pre Western civilization go to Tanzania exactly on the equator and look at 60 people living in indigenous societies without the influence of Western society on them, aka they are farmers and herders and don't wear a lot of clothes. They are on the equator, so they get 365 days of sun a year. Their vitamin D level is 55. 
Look at your teenage children and at the end of summer their vitamin D level is, if they're lifeguards, is 70. If they're just playing outside all the time, it's 60. If you go to a tanning booth, if you take your 20-year-old who's gone to a tanning booth eight times, her level of vitamin D is 60. If you look at chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans and bonobos living in their native habitat, their vitamin D level is 60. There's a trend here. Uh, I'd say 60 is what you ought to aim for. You know, there's actually, with breast cancer, there seems to be less and less and less breast cancer up to 80. Okay. So, in fact, parathyroid hormone keeps dropping, 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 dropping up to 80. So 80 may be a good number, too. But I th I just, I'm personally of a belief, I just try to create what nature created for us. And I say 60 is an awfully nice number, as opposed to saying, how many milligrams should I take or how many units should I take? I say recreate, get a blood test, recreate what nature makes in us naturally. Because what we do know, Neil Binkley from Madison showed Wisconsin women who aren't on a supplement on vitamin D get down to about 15 in the winter mm -hmm. and 45 in the summer. African American women at Sinai, I drew about 1,000 vitamin D levels, much to administration's annoyance. Uh, African American women in Milwaukee have vitamin D levels of 7. You know, and it doesn't rise much in the summer. So that's why they have a greater disease burden of obesity, a greater disease burden of uh, broken bones, more tuberculosis, more cancer, more breast cancer, more MS, more diabetes, more, it's like. You know, though what I find in doctors telling their patients, because I do bone density here greater, they're telling their patients, oh, you're at 23, you're normal. And then they take them off to be, and I'm like, are you kidding me here? Yeah, this is what they're told. Would you please take home 200 of my business cards and slide them under people's names? <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm sending half my patients to Freighter for their blood work, so I'm a good customer. I can, you can refer to me. So, any other questions? I'll stay as long as you want. Anybody wants to leave, I won't be hurt. I, it's such a gorgeous evening out there. There's dandelions to pull if you want. So. <laughs> Once a disease is in place, we've got problems. But I would say you have no idea how bad that problem is going to get worse if you don't do something now. So my advice is get on the D and the K, yes, because it's, if you think it's bad now, wait till later. You know. Uh, do I have to eat a lot more protein to make this K2 effective? No. Do you have to eat more protein to make yeah, K2 effective? Keep using that little word I don't protein in there. think so. Good. No. Your body doesn't like more than about 300, 400 calories a day of protein, so that's any more than that, you start feeling crummy. Thank you. Yeah. you were saying that we don't need to take calcium supplements. However, what about magnesium? Oh, magnesium is, we should all be on magnesium am, supplements. Am, Everybody here. If you want, I mean, part of the comb study was magnesium. It's a clear that you need magnesium. I give folks a four, I just, any magnesium but magnesium oxide, because magnesium oxide just gives you loose balls. You know, so I say magnesium glycinate or magnesium chelate or magnesium, you know, anything. So I give folks a 400 milligram of magnesium malate, because malate is actually two bicarbs put together, and I like to do things to alkalize people. That's a whole different discussion. For bone density, and my patients in my practice, I take patients that are bone density and I also balance their hormones because there's good evidence once you have adequate estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, that by itself builds bone density. But there's also very, very strong evidence that having an alkaline lifestyle or an alkaline, uh, getting yourself alkalinized also builds bone density. And so there's clear evidence that those three, so what you want to do is I want to take every winning theory I can and reverse it. Don't worry about the calcium. But what if you don't drink milk at all? Do you eat spinach? Lots. You're in good shape. Okay. Spinach has much more bioavailable calcium than milk. Okay. So. What's the strontium? Strontium? Oh, you're talking to a chemistry major. <laughs> <laughs> On the periodic table of elements, strontium is exactly right below calcium. So it is exactly the same chemical reactivity as calcium, but it's a little bigger. So it fits in bone a little snugger. And it's been known to actually, all by itself, increase bone density about 
50% as effective as Fosamax. No toxicity. Strontium has a slightly, you have a subliminal anxiety about strontium because back in the 1970s, when we were doing above ground testing in New Mexico of nuclear bombs, some of that above ground stuff ended up in New York State where we were able to measure that cow milk had radioactive strontium in it. So that created a bit of a furor. So we all remember what happened to, where was strontium? But that's not, strontium isn't radioactive naturally. It requires nuclear bomb testing, and so, <laughs> you know, so, so the North Koreans are probably getting a little bit polluted, but the rest of us are doing okay. Yes? I'm still not clear on whether to take the MK4 or 7, or do you like the combination? Uh, we don't know. Uh, what we know is that MK7 in NATO does have an effect on bone fracture rate in Japan, so it does work, but we've also know that there's some evidence showing it MK7 doesn't activate the osteocalcin in some of the genes near as much as the MK4. MK4 is what God made in you. So my belief is MK4 is probably what we need. And there's also clear evidence that MK4, 45 milligrams a day, is enough to reverse the calcification that happens in folks with Coumadin. So, so that's considered a low dose. So I say, okay, for the rest of us, how about 100 milligrams or micrograms? Micrograms. Right, micrograms. So, yes? Uh, I've seen twin labs. Yeah. They made a, a K2 with natto. Now, I wonder, like, doesn't natto have to be like a bulk full? If this is with natto, I don't know how much, but there's not much natto in there. <laughs> there's also, yeah, who knows? I mean, I mean, right. It's just Right. We just don't know, and that's that. But now you've got the intro, you've got the you've now got the idea. That you also know how naive we are. We just don't know these questions. The good news is this is really a pre pretty simple idea with just unbelievably dramatic implications. So it's not complicated. It's pretty easy. It's just a simple supplement, and you know there's no way we're going back to living on grass-raised animals in this industrial society easily. So. Find some grass-raised meat if you can, and if you can't, you know, take a, take a supplement and keep your back strong and your muscles strong and your, and your brain healthy and your pancreas good and your, yeah. yes? I just wanted to know if you have any experience with the standard process? Or with? Standard process? Yes. Picking yeah. up in lab. Uh, right. Are they formulating, K2, are they formulating? Do you have any oh. I've had really good luck with them. Yeah, with them. Standard Process is a, well, it's a good Wisconsin company. They're yeah. super reputable. They've got a lot of great products. I don't know about their K2 product. I'm sure they do. All these labs, all these supplement companies, back row, look up there on this. That's all the Standard Process, all those brown boxes. Can you find something in the K2 line? <laughs> I'm, I would, I'd be surprised if they didn't because their Standard Process is so innovative. They're yeah. pretty quick adapters. Yeah, they're pretty quick adapters. Yes, yes. Coumadin, okay. and I'm probably going to be anxious about anybody with factor, uh, light, factor 5 Leiden. So families who have blood clots, who make, make a lot of blood clots, there is an overlap between K2 and K1. And in Japan, I have one person in my practice who in fact has factor 5 Leiden insufficiency, so her family all makes blood clots all over the place. She's currently not taking any blood thinner, she's taking natokinase only. Okay? She said, is it safe for me to take the K2? And I said, I don't know. I, I would be anxious to advise you to do it. But in Japan, I found a study, the following study in Japan. Intraventricular hemorrhage in newborns is a bad thing. And going through a, a female pelvis, when you're trying to push your head through a pelvis outlet that's only this big, you get a few kids have intraventricular bleeding, one out of a gazillion. When they give <coughs> MK7 to babies, I'm, I'm sorry, MK4 to babies, that's K2, human K2, they stop the bleeding cold. Yeah. So they're now giving, in Japan, they're giving MK2, um, or MK4, which is the human, to babies to prevent intraventricular bleeding at birth. Well, that's a blood clotting effect. So there's some overlap. But that's all the evidence we got. We don't have anything, any, that's the best study I could find. But your father is on blood thinner and on K. Right. And he went to his 
his pharmacist who called me up and had a long and curious talk with me, and his pharmacist is now taking K2. <laughs> I consider that a therapeutic intervention. So thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate it. If you'd like to get my business card or whatever, and I've got letters. Okay, appreciate it.